salt and pepper, pretty good combination. How about salt and sun? That works pretty good too. We'll show you that tonight on Neotropolis. This is not business as usual. Welcome to Neotropolis. We are not business as usual. Hi, I'm your host, Jim Evans. Tonight we're going to spend some time with an established and seasoned manufacturing company here in Northeast Ohio that is working on a different project for them. They have a familiar name, but are now in a different game, Salt Technology. Who they are and what they're doing is right around the corner. But first we take a look at regional business news from the Neotropolis Good Business News Aggregator. This is the Good Business News along the I-77 corridor for the week of February 21st. Saturday's Akron Beacon Journal community section reports that Summit County Executive Russ Pry unveiled a new initiative called the Summit Jobs Partnership. Using the University of Akron to conduct an initial workforce needs survey, the partnership will identify industry clusters that are important to the region and match training programs to make workers qualified for jobs in the new market. Sunday's Kent Record Courier front page reports that Oregon-based DACON a rubber extrusion plant, plans to establish a new location in Ravenna Township. Up to 18 new jobs will be created at this facility. Tuesday's Cleveland Plain Dealer Business section reports that Northeast Ohio-based mining supply companies are seeing increased demand for products due to rising commodities prices in the iron ore, plastics, and coal sectors. Companies such as Cleveland's American Mine Door Company and Cliffs Natural Resources and Solon-based Bedford Gear have all reported strong increases in sales orders. Wednesday's Cleveland Plain Dealer Business section reports that General Motors may bring a diesel version of its Lordstown-built Chevrolet Cruze to North America next year. The company has already been testing some Cruze diesel models and could be selling the cars as 2013 models next year. Wednesday's Akron Beacon Journal front page reports that Germany-based Rockling Automotive, an automotive parts manufacturer, has agreed to build a 75,000 square foot facility in Akron. The plant could open by the end of 2011 and employ as many as 123 skilled hourly workers by 2013. Wednesday's Akron Beacon Journal and Kent Record Courier report that President Obama saluted local company Kent Displays during a small business forum in Cleveland on Tuesday. Obama cited Kent Displays for its innovation and noted that they are doing the unusual for a consumer electronics business, manufacturing in the United States and exporting abroad. Thursday's Cleveland Plain Dealer Metro section reports that Rock Ohio Caesars, the developer of Cleveland's proposed downtown casino, has signed a five-year lease for four floors of the historic Higby Building where a Phase 1 gambling operation will open in about a year. This is the good business news along the I-77 corridor for this week. Neotropolis is your source for good business news. Most of us know about the power of salt, right? But how about salt for power and energy? A valuable resource in many more ways than one. We're going to sprinkle that on you in a couple of moments. But right now, we spend important time with our content partner, The Business Journal, with Wiggly Buzz. I'm Stacia Ertis with the Business Journal Weekly Buzz for Youngstown and the Mahoning Valley. The buzz out of the Mahoning Valley this week has been all about Senate Bill 5. Early in the week, protesters gathered at Youngstown State University for a rally against the bill that would eliminate collective bargaining for state employees and limit it for local public workers. And this, the scene in Columbus, as labor members arrived by buses at the State House for a hearing on the bill, where many of them were locked out. Case is trying to go! Case is trying to go! Case is trying to go! On Thursday, labor protesters, as well as Tea Party members in support of Senate Bill 5, turned out in force to greet Governor Kasich as he arrived for a regional chamber luncheon at the Youngstown Warren Regional Airport. 1,209. That's how many jobs the Youngstown One Regional Chamber says its development team helped to create in 2010. 
At the chamber's annual economic forecast breakfast, it reported more than 1,200 jobs created with 19 completed projects and more than $775 million in new asset investment, most notably landing B&M Star's new $650 million steel mill. The keynote speaker, Catherine Kleber, the executive director of the Marcella Shale Coalition, talked about the future of natural gas in the region's role. Youngstown was the topic of a weekly live chat on the website of the Detroit Free Press. Presley Gillespie, executive director of the Youngstown Neighborhood Development Corporation, was asked what lessons Detroit can learn from Youngstown as the Motor City tries to right-size itself as Youngstown has work to do under the 2010 plan. As well as, again, looking at how do you get everyone to buy into the concept that you now are a shrinking city and get everyone on the same page, leadership, in, as well as private-public partnerships. The online chat was a follow-up to a story on the city that appeared in Sunday's edition of the paper. And those are this week's headlines. Be sure to check out the Buzz Newscast every business day online at businessjournaldaily.com. I'm Stacia Ertis. We'll see you next week. Now it's time for a Neotropolis fact. Did you know that Akron is the home of America's first toy company, SC Dyke Company, a marble manufacturer? There's certainly a need to continue to develop and enhance sustainable sources of energy and power. You've heard that before, right? But you know, that will never get thrown out in the worn out phrase file. So a company here in Northeast Ohio is now on the list of those working on that theme. And they're doing so with the development of a molten salt solar generator. This process uses the sun to heat and, well, let's allow Sarah Taylor to tell us about how Babcock and Wilcox is not doing business as usual. We all know sunlight can be a rarity during Ohio winters. A sunny day sure can lift our moods. These days, it's also playing a role in lifting Ohio's economy and our nation's dependence on fossil fuels for energy. In a not business as usual collaboration, Babcock and Wilcox Power Generation Group here in Barberton is working with a California company to harness the sun's power to produce energy. We've been around since the late 1800s. Images of the men who founded Babcock and Wilcox figure prominently in the lobby of the company's research center at the Power Generation Group headquarters in Barberton. Stephen Wilcox patented the water tube boiler back in 1856. He and George Babcock started the company in 1867. One of their first set of boilers was owned by none other than Thomas Edison, who referred to them in this framed letter also on display. You know, a lot of that, uh, the research center itself is a testament to B&W's history of innovation and success. This new center opened in late 2006 and has allowed B&W to continue to build on its heritage. We have a uh, reputation for making things work, for making new technologies reliable and affordable. We have a lot of uh, credibility in the uh, power industry for making things work. That credibility is what attracted a California company founded just four years ago. Burbank-based eSolar was looking for a partner in its bid to create low-cost, utility-scale solar power. About three years ago, they actually found us because they're, uh, they put together a bunch of really smart people uh, that have uh, made the uh, mirror technology uh, uh, low-cost and they needed someone to do the part of the project that turns that sun energy into thermal energy. So they actually approached us and we sat down and talked about working together and, uh, and uh, we formed a relationship back then. E-Solar's mirrors or heliostats are laid out in a field. This company video aims to show how quickly and efficiently the field can be set up. The mirrors are made to be sturdy. Three millimeter thick glass is mounted in a metal frame. E-Solar's vice president of engineering, Carter Morrison, says they withstand even a direct hail impact. E-Solar developed a calibration system that allows the mirrors to track the sun, reflecting its rays up to a tower that holds a solar receiver designed by Babcock and Wilcox engineers. It's quite a demanding environment for an engineer to design to because when you focus all that energy into one small place, it's pretty demanding. Maybe take a trip out to East Solar next week. With the team B&W dedicated to the task takes inspiration from a 1931 Edison quote outside their office, in which Edison said, I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. So we put a small core design team together. They uh, 
uh, really own making the design work to meet the customer's requirements. But uh, we need experts in various engineering disciplines with materials and fluids, uh, even manufacturing. Uh, we do work down at our research center on material work for some of these materials are very corrosive. So we take all these experts around the company and put them as consultants into this design team and then the design team brings it all together to uh, actually build something and put it out there. The solar receiver the team designed debuted in summer 2009 when eSolar went online with its Sierra Sun Tower plant in Lancaster, California, north of LA. It is the only solar power tower plant operating in North America. So when we saw it work and work well, <laughs> it's always reassuring to know that your design actually worked and, uh, and uh, so it's very, uh, very exciting. It's fun to be on the cutting edge of new technology. The solar receiver currently generates steam that runs a turbine. Now the two companies are working on taking it a step further using molten salt. At room temperature it's a solid, but at high temperatures it becomes a liquid. But its advantage is that it stores a lot of thermal energy. So the idea of using molten salt with solar is to heat it up very hot and you can store it for long periods of time and it will retain its heat. So it's a good uh, medium to store a lot of uh, heat energy. So that's what makes it attractive. The Department of Energy is funding the two companies' effort to create a baseload molten salt power plant. The um, point of the DOE project was to put new technologies out there that reduce the cost of making power with solar energy. The Energy Department cast a wide net, funding more than a dozen CSP, or Concentrating Solar Power, projects. Many are competing to see who will come up with the most successful approach. Kip Alexander is comfortable with the direction they're going. And the promise of the power tower uh, approach that we're working on is to get to very high uh, temperatures in the, working, in the system. And that allows high efficiency. And one of the important things in having low cost is having high efficiency. So that's kind of why we're going after that. It has, every, each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. But uh, we think that the combination of high efficiency with the thermal storage is going to be a low-cost winner. B&W and E-Solar are nearing completion on phase one of the project. They'll present results to the Department of Energy in hopes of receiving additional funding, up to $10.8 million in all, to complete all three phases, which should happen towards the end of 2012. In Barberton, I'm Sarah Taylor for Western Reserve PBS. Are you not doing business as usual? Then email us at neotropolis.org. Tell us how you're changing your business, organization, or government agency to compete in the new economy. And who knows, you could be starring on Neotropolis, not business as usual. So we took a look at sustainable energy from a microeconomic point of view. Now we talk with experts in the field for a macroeconomic perspective, or what we like to call fly-eye economics. With over 4,000 lenses, the eyes of a common housefly are among the most complex in the insect world. With us tonight are panelists John Schober, Director of Innovation with Magnet, and Kevin Snape, Vice President of Sustainability and Energy Initiatives with Cuyahoga Community College. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us on our show tonight. First off, talk about the challenges a manufacturer like Babcock and Wilcox faces in researching and developing a product like this. John? Sure. Uh, so Babcock and Wilcox have been around for quite some time. Um, so they've had success, sustain, sustained success over a, a longer period of time. So they've had some success in the past in doing this. You, know, you don't get to be that old without uh, being able to take on some new projects. Um, but they started to work with a company, uh, I believe it was eSolar, um, to uh, leverage some expertise outside their own organization. Right. And they also worked with the Department of Energy on the funding and, and trying to meet their objectives. So I think one of the biggest challenges is working outside your organization. It's tough enough to get everybody on board inside your company towards a, a common objective. Now you have to work with companies outside, and they all have different interests. So I think it's one of the, the bigger challenges of the company like, like Babcock Wilcox. Kevin, you added that, or, or you know, I was going to follow that up with um, a, a company, as he mentioned, such as Babcock and Wilcox, uh, you know, an established uh, company as they are. 
Is this a risky proposition for them? Oh, it's incredibly risky. I mean, what they're doing is they're trying to leverage someone else's technology that they didn't develop. They're then trying to figure out how they're going to integrate it. And then they've got to figure out, even if they can get it to work, how do they manufacture it? And, and what kind of a supply chain does that look like? And so they've got just a whole host of hurdles they've got to get over. Most companies, of course, they start a new product and they really evaluate their uh, return on investment. Um, getting into something like this where they're not even really sure how this will pay off, how, how does a company approach something like that? I think one of the things you do is you accept that you don't know exactly what the return on the project is okay. going to be. Um, so you start out and thinking about is it a, uh, you know, what's your upside? Uh, what do you think is a realistic assumption? And then what's the downside? What's the uh, most damage that can be done to your company considering the worst case scenario? I think if you start out with that mindset, uh, understanding that you have, uh, it, it's an uncertain proposition to move forward, the company will approach it the right way. I think a lot of companies yeah. make the mistake of thinking that, well, if I put these numbers down, that's the number I'm going to meet. And if you don't, it's not a success. Um, if you take that approach of understanding there's some, you know, some uncertainty, then I think you're, 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 you're putting yourself in a position to take the right approach with the project. And I mean, one of the other things that a lot of companies do is, I mean, th they have an inverse relationship between risk and expense, that what they'll do is they'll take a little bit of money early on to do the really hard analysis, okay. and then as their level of risk drops, that's when you see the money start to spool up. So by the time you get to the point where they're ready to commit to a full-size installation, they're pretty darn confident they know what they're going to get, more or less. And, and they're no longer taking that big risk. And the other thing I'll add to that is, you know, they, they, they started out by working with organizations outside of their own, with, with people outside of their own organization, which is a great first step because you're, you're, you're having somebody else take on that risk that, that you would have to take on all by yourself. Sure. So it's not just finances, but it's also resources. Um, so to the extent that you can work outside your own organization to minimize that risk, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, approach to take. Development of, of these, um, this technology, is this done by machines or people? And, and what type of skill set would people have to have yes. to do this? It's yes, both. both. <laughs> I mean, it always is. I mean, you're looking at two very different kinds of skill sets. I mean, one is you need very high-end science. I mean, you know, molten salt is not something you wish to mess around with. You need to know what on earth you're doing before you hurt people. But the other thing is you need an incredible amount of engineering because what you're doing is you're taking what used to be this tiny little chamber that you could heat up salt in, and you're now trying to scale it up to something that's in the megawatt scale. And that's an incredibly complicated process. And, and you know, the research scientists aren't going to get you there. That's where you need that engineering skill set. And then finally, you need to come around full circle and, and turn it over to manufacturing folks with all their Six Sigma skills and everything they're bringing to the table. And you've got at least three, a cluster of three really high skill folks who have to work this thing through. In a development on a project like this, I, I'm somewhat familiar with the solar thermal technology okay. in general. I, I've done some, some research on it in the past. This is not a project that you're going to see a great return on in the, in the next couple of years. I mean, it's going to be something that's going to get adopted over a longer period of time around the world. Now, are these guys going to be the winner on that technology? Are they going to be the winner in the U.S.? Who knows? Um, but uh, you, you ultimately have to take different approaches over that extended period of time of developing this, not just getting the core technology down, but all the bells and whistles on it that's going to make an acceptable technology for whomever wants to adopt it. Now, is this technology feasible for Northeast Ohio? That's a great question. Um, solar technology works in Northeast Ohio, but that's mainly solar PV. And you lose a little bit of efficiency because of the cloud cover, but it, it's still a, a functional technology. This is all based on infrared, and I'm, I've not really heard how well it reacts. I mean, this is the same technology they're talking about putting into the deserts in the southwest and generating, you know, hundreds and thousands of megawatts of power that way. But they're counting on the fact that they're getting direct sunlight. So it's not clear to me how well it's going to scale up here. Do you perceive, as this perhaps moves forward, resistance from traditional energy companies, or would this be something that would be uh, welcomed and, and adopted? Uh, I, I would answer yes again. I think there's going to be some that will say this, is, this yeah. fits well into my portfolio, and there will be some companies that fight it every step of the way. Um, it, it, what you'll find in the energy world is that there's lots of different solutions for uh, lots of different applications, and it's not just solar. Um, energy storage can often be viewed as a, an alternative to power. Um, it gives you actually more capacity in, on the grid. 
Um, so as companies are, are thinking about whether or not I want to get on the train with this or not or fight it in some way, they're going to think, you know, do I have a good position? And if I don't, can I delay it so that I can get a good position? But ultimately, I think th this technology has a place. Whether or not it's in Northeast Ohio, it's, I, I really can't answer that. But it, it will, I think it will have a place somewhere in the world. I mean, in the renewable portfolio-driven energy universe, they've got to come up with renewable energy one form or another. So they've got that going for it. But there, a lot of power companies are incredibly conservative organizations. I, you know, their job is to deliver an electron constantly. And anything that they might think is intermittent or anything else gets really f scary to them. So, I mean, that's just a reality these guys are going to have to work through. They're, they're only going to be generating power when the sun shines. Yep. Could there be regulatory challenges that they'll face in any way, shape, or form? Always. I mean, you know, the wind power projects off of Cape Cod are still being regulated and litigated, and, you know, that looks like it will never end. I, anytime there's a local community involved, you've got zoning issues, you've got uh, public, yes. public groups. I mean, they're all going to get involved in this. And I don't think this is going to be any more wor better or worse than, say, wind turbines. Mm -hmm. You mentioned community. You see this technology perhaps at some point, if it does move forward as, as we all probably hope it will, would this technology be able to provide energy for an entire community? Yeah, I'm not familiar with enough of the technology to... Uh, I, it depends how large they can scale it up. I mean, the, the kinds of... Where they're talking about doing this out in the um, desert southwest, they're talking about generating enough to drive cities. Um, and one or two installations. So, I mean, it, it theoretically scales up to the same size as coal-fired power plants and larger sometimes. It's just a question of can you get enough sunlight and what do you do in the middle of the night? We only have a moment left, but uh, what businesses might benefit from this type of energy technology? Maybe all of them. I don't know. Um, I mean, anyone who deals with computer controls, because all of those little mirrors are going to have to be, be... Anyone who does precision machining... I mean, this is uh, the one thing you can say about this kind of technology is it's, it's kind of like sh rocket science because you've got to keep a very small target between the sun, the mirror, and that little bell is, you know, is your entire range. So there's a lot of businesses locally that might benefit. A lot of things involved. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Unfortunately, we could go on for a while here, but we sure thank you for your time on the night show. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Again, Babcock and Wilcox working for the future. And with that, it's time now for Into the Future. Into the future. Hi, I'm Ron Doman from Flaming River Industries. Flaming River Industries is a growing aftermarket automotive company. Founded in 1987 with an objective for developing steering systems for muscle cars, classic cars, street rods, off-road and racing. Our corporate headquarters and manufacturing facility in Berea, Ohio has the highest and latest CNC and laser equipment for manufacturing, testing, and assembly. With quality technicians, our products are made to last. Quality craftsmanship, high-grade material made in the USA makes our tilt steering columns and power rack and pinions the leader in the industry offering our customers the highest quality and durability possible. We have partnered with Magnet to achieve ISO certification. Through this process, this will allow us to expand our business opportunities. Over the last several years, we have expanded our research and development manufacturing to expand into global markets. Magnet's expertise allows us the structure to expand the system into greater product standards. Northeast Ohio is known as a hardcore automotive and heavy duty manufacturing. In that light, one of our products, our battery disconnect switch, has been strategically placed into the aftermarket heavy duty truck industry. We service customers such as Peterbilt, Mack Truck, and Kenworth. In the specialty automotive markets, we distribute our products from Summit Racing to Gilner Engineering's or Bo Lobeck's V8 shop. We believe in Ohio, and we're proud that our products are made in the USA. Our philosophy is, if it doesn't say Flaming River, it's just not good enough.
Thank you. And for more information, go to FlamingRiver.com. We also like to season our show with news on the financial field. And the experts at NCA Financial Planners are here to help us do that now with the Stock Wrap. This week's local company is Progressive Corporation, headquartered in Mayfield Village, Ohio. Progressive is an insurance holding company whose subsidiaries provide commercial and personal auto insurance and other property and casualty insurance and related services throughout the United States. Progressive has been in business since 1937 and now has more than 10 million policies in force through insurance sold directly to customers online and by phone, as well as policies offered through more than 30,000 local independent agents. In addition to auto insurance, Progressive offers the following types of insurance to customers throughout the country, boat, personal watercraft, commercial auto, homeowners, motorcycle, RV, and even Segway insurance. Progressive is one of the largest auto insurance groups in the United States thanks to innovations including comparison rates and 24-7 customer and claim service. Its growth continues to be steady pace too. Between 1996 and 2005, Progressive grew an average of 17% per year. Progressive has 28,000 plus employees in more than 450 offices throughout the country. The corporation is a publicly traded stock on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol PGR. The midweek close was $20.16. Year to date, the stock is up 1.46%, and for the previous five years, the stock is down 25.65%. Thanks, and back to you. You want sustainable? Hey, we've got sustainable. With culture and entertainment in Northeast Ohio as well. And we have just a guy who can empower you on that. He's Cool Cleveland's Thomas Mulready. And he joins us now to tell you about some other events that are going on in Neotropolis this weekend. What we're talking about is the business of fun. Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com. And this week, we want to talk about jazz. You know, a lot of people look at my hat. It's a pork pie. And they say, that's jazz. You must be a jazz player. And the fact is, that is jazz. We have great jazz throughout Northeast Ohio. Of course, I'm here today in Cleveland Heights, right in front of Night Town, one of the top 100 clubs, according to Downbeat Magazine, in the country for jazz. They have so much going on here. Uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, they've got Blue Lunch doing a saxophone shootout. Uh, there's a vocalist called Mina, and another vocalist, Pat Harris, will be coming up. Uh, Daryl Sherman and Jay Lenhart duo are coming up here at Night Town. Uh, don't forget also in the Cleveland area, the Mardi Gras that's on East 21st and the Bop Stop is another place for some great jazz when they open that club up. It's not always open. Uh, in Akron, of course, the north side will have jazz. In Youngstown, the Cedar Lounge and Restaurant is known for not only jazz but indie and rock. It's a very casual, inexpensive place. They've got Mediterranean American cuisine there. They're at North Hazel Street in downtown Youngstown. And then the Lorraine County Community College, the Stalker Arts Center, has Jonathan Kingham and Ryan Chase Smith coming up. They're doing everything from jazz to country to hip-hop to R&B. And then don't forget Oberlin, where we're training a lot of great classical musicians as well as jazz. They just built that new jazz building, the Cole Jazz Building at Oberlin. And they have the Oberlin Jazz Septet and the Jazz Faculty Optet. So plenty of jazz in Northeast Ohio. Check it out. This is Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com. Have a great week in Neotropolis. No doubt there are things that you could do to help the Northeast Ohio economy. It's easy, too. Simply get out to any of the events Thomas told us about and make your investment in fun. You can also position yourself out there and make your brilliant comments about the Northeast Ohio economy when you ask the people at the table to please pass the salt. Tell them to spread the word. In the meantime, log on to our website, neotropolis.org, and tell us what you think. I'm Jim Evans. We'll see you next week on Neotropolis, not business as usual. Funding for Neotropolis has been provided by the Burton D. Morgan Foundation, committed to the free enterprise system. First Place Bank is proud to sponsor Neotropolis. As a community bank, First Place Bank believes we are only as strong as the communities we serve. Locally owned businesses are the cornerstone of our communities. 
We concentrate on helping local businesses make the most of their resources through a variety of services delivered with a community banking touch. The Dominion Foundation. Jumpstart. Working with entrepreneurs to accelerate the growth of their high potential businesses to create a more prosperous economic future for Northeast Ohio. The Raymond John Wien Foundation. Youngstown Business Incubator. Next week on Neotropolis, more buzz, stock wrap, and into the future. Find out who is not doing business as usual. Now stay tuned for Newsnight.